Today, we'll uncover five real stories of the most chilling events at summer camps. These are true accounts of mysterious incidents that left communities in shock and will make you question the safety of summer camps. Join us as we delve into the unsettling details of these real life cases. It was July 6, 2023, at the Smuggler's Notch Resort in Vermont. Tate Holtzman, a bright, energetic three-year-old, was attending his first day of summer camp at the resort. His parents, Zachary and Jennifer, had enrolled him in the day camp program, hoping he would enjoy the activities and make new friends. The family lived locally, and Zachary even worked at the resort, which they all loved. On that sunny afternoon, Tate and his camp group arrived at the resort's Notchville Water Park, a popular attraction featuring multiple pools and a splash pad. As the children played, Tate fell and scraped his knee. Counselors walked him to a picnic table near the splash pad to clean his leg. Once his wound was tended to, they told him to rejoin the other campers on the splash pad. As Tate started walking back, something unimaginable happened. He stepped on what looked like a solid plastic lid in the grass. The lid, supposed to cover a 3,500 gallon cistern, flipped in the air. Tate disappeared into the dark water-filled hole below. Counselors screamed for help and lifeguards from nearby pools rushed to the scene. The hole was the entrance to an underground water storage tank 12 feet long, 6 feet wide, and 6 feet deep. The lifeguards and counselors immediately began rescue attempts, diving into the tank to save Tate. The tank's depth and the swirling water made their task incredibly difficult. Lifeguards could only stay submerged for 15 to 20 seconds at a time, desperately trying to locate the boy in the pitch black water. Minutes ticked by and the situation grew more dire. One lifeguard thought he felt Tate with his foot but couldn't grasp him. Finally, someone brought a flashlight, revealing Tate's small, motionless body floating in the water. They pulled him out and began CPR. Emergency medical technicians arrived and took over, rushing Tate to the University of Vermont Medical Center in Burlington. Zachary and Jennifer received a call from the resort, informing them of an accident involving their son. They raced to the camp following the ambulance to the hospital, their hearts filled with dread and confusion. Two days later, despite the best efforts of the medical team, Tate succumbed to his injuries. The chief medical examiner's office determined the cause of his death was drowning, and the manner of death was ruled an accident. The Holtzmans were devastated. Tate was their only child, a boy full of compassion, kindness, curiosity, and a love for adventure. They could not fully understand how such a tragedy could occur. Their grief was followed by questions about how this preventable accident happened. Why was the lid to the cistern not secured with bolts? Why were there no danger signs? How could such an obvious hazard be left unaddressed in a place frequented by children? Investigations into the incident began immediately. The Vermont Occupational Safety and Health Administration conducted a thorough review and found multiple safety violations at the resort. The lid, designed to be held in place with bolts and marked with danger signs, was neither secured nor marked. Employees working on the tank couldn't recall if the lid ever had bolts, and it was found lying in the grass beside the hole on the day of the incident. VOSHA fined Smuggler's Notch $31,000 for six serious labor safety violations. The fines were later reduced to $22,000 after the resort took corrective measures, such as replacing the cover, adding danger signs, and changing employee procedures. Despite these actions, the resort's CEO, Lisa Howe, expressed uncertainty about why the bolts were missing, stating, We'll never know why the bolts weren't in the place where there were holes for the bolts. The Vermont State Police also conducted an investigation, but no criminal charges were filed. The police report confirmed that the tank's lid was never bolted down as it should have been, leading to Tate's fall and subsequent drowning. As the investigations unfolded, the Holtzmans sought justice for their son. They hired a Boston attorney, Jennifer Denker, who specializes in wrongful death claims. Denker stated, This was a preventable tragedy caused by an incredibly dangerous product lacking certain available safety features, made all the more dangerous by its improper installation and lack of warning. She indicated that the family might pursue legal action against potentially liable parties, including the manufacturer of the cistern lid. The Holtzman's grief was profound, but their determination to prevent similar tragedies from happening to other families was strong. They started a petition to replace the resort's splash pad with a memorial garden in Tate's honor. 
By January 18, 2024, the petition had gathered over 1,000 signatures. Additionally, nearly 1,000 people donated more than $101,000 to the family through an online fundraiser. The resort implemented several safety improvements following the incident. The splash pad area was closed for the rest of the season and a locked fence was installed around the cistern. The rubber lid was replaced with a heavy metal one that would take multiple people or machinery to lift. Below the lid, a new grate was installed to prevent anyone from falling in, even if the lid was removed. The resort also hired a company to evaluate potential safety hazards and recommend further improvements. Despite these changes, the Holtzmans remained vigilant. They wanted to ensure that no other family would have to endure the pain of losing a child due to unsecured water tanks or septic systems. Their attorney, Denker, emphasized their determination, saying, they want to ensure no other family is subjected to the devastating loss of a child due to unsecured water tanks or septic systems. It was July 3, 2013, at Camp Tawanga near Yosemite National Park. Anais Rittenberg, a 21-year-old art counselor, was having breakfast with fellow staff members outside the camp's dining hall. Anais was a student at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she majored in environmental studies and served as the world music director at the college radio station. She was known for her passion for environmental issues and her love for music. The morning was calm with about 25 staff members scattered around the campfire circle, chatting and enjoying their meal. Suddenly, without warning, a massive oak tree about 32 feet tall snapped and fell towards the group. The heavy limb came crashing down, striking Anais and four other staff members. The impact was immediate and devastating. Anais Rittenberg was killed instantly. The other four staff members, Lizzie Moore, Kara Sheedy, Juliet Ulibari, and Anya Schultz, were injured and taken to local hospitals. Lizzie and Kara were transported to hospitals in Modesto, while Juliet and Anya were treated at Sonora Regional Medical Center and released shortly after. The scene was chaotic. Emergency responders, including personnel from Yosemite, Cal Fire, the U.S. Forest Service, the Tuolumne County Sheriff's Office, and the Office of Emergency Services arrived within minutes. The tree had also struck a power line, causing temporary power outages at the camp. Generators were used to restore electricity while repairs were underway. Camp Tawanga, a Jewish overnight camp with a rich history dating back to 1925, was left in shock. The camp director, Ken Kramars, issued an official statement expressing deep sorrow for the loss of Anais. He assured parents that no children were harmed as they were inside the dining hall at the time of the incident. On-site staff therapists and first responder grief experts were brought in to support the campers and the rest of the camp community. Despite the immediate response, communication with parents was slow. Many parents learned about the accident through social media before receiving any official communication from the camp. Rabbi Ruth Abush Magder, whose teenage son was a counselor in training at Tawanga, expressed her frustration at the lack of timely information. Amy Friedman, another parent, only learned about the tragedy from a reporter's phone call. Anais's family was devastated. Her mother, Penny Kreitzer, learned about the tree fall from the news before realizing her daughter was involved. Desperate for information, she called hospitals and was momentarily hopeful when she couldn't locate Anais. However, the harsh truth was revealed by a law enforcement official. In the aftermath, Anais's father, Mark Rittenberg, and her brother, Adam Rittenberg, demanded accountability. They believed the camp had been negligent and ignored warnings from tree trimmers and arborists. Mark Rittenberg stated, I miss my beauty every single day. And I think what's motivating me almost two years since she was killed is that Anais didn't have to die. Anais was killed because, in my view, of willful negligence. Camp Tawanga, however, labeled the incident as a freak accident. They claimed that trees at the camp were routinely inspected by certified arborists and that they had consistently followed recommendations for their maintenance and removal. Since Anais's death, the camp had hired two arborists to inspect every tree on the property. The camp director, who the family wanted to resign, stated that the board had voted to keep her in her position. The California Division of Occupational Safety and Health conducted a probe and found no safety breaches. However, the Rittenberg family continued to advocate for change, highlighting alleged negligence and calling for better safety measures. Anais Rittenberg's death had a huge impact on the Camp Tawanga community. 
She was remembered as a beloved staff member, an environmental advocate, and a talented DJ at her college radio station. Her friends and colleagues at the University of California, Santa Cruz, were left in shock and mourning. Alec Howard, the station manager, described her as a poised, sweet woman who was beloved by her fellow DJs. The camp, located on 160 acres on the Tuolumne River, had long been a popular destination for families in the San Francisco Bay Area. With about 300 campers and 150 staff members, Camp Tawanga offered sessions for students from second to 12th grades. Following the accident, Camp Tawanga implemented more strict tree safety measures. Certified arborists were hired to conduct regular inspections, and the camp committed to following expert advice on tree maintenance and removal. Despite these efforts, the Rittenberg family remained unconvinced, continuing to push for greater accountability and transparency. It was April 20, 2005, in the North Georgia mountains, at the Appalachian Wilderness Camp in Cleveland. Travis Parker, a 13-year-old boy from Douglas County, Georgia, was sent to this state-run camp for troubled youth. Travis had a history of behavioral issues and was on probation after hitting his grandmother, Golden Griffin, and threatening her with a knife. Despite their troubled relationship, Golden Griffin cared deeply for Travis, having adopted him when he was just 18 months old. On this day, Travis confronted a counselor for withholding food as punishment. The counselors decided to restrain him. What happened next led to a tragic series of events that would end in Travis's death and a subsequent legal battle. As the confrontation escalated, six counselors, Ryan Chapman, Paul Binford, Matthew Deasing, Torben Vining, Johnny Harris, and Philip Elliott, decided to restrain Travis. Witnesses reported that Travis was held face down by at least three counselors at a time. Travis, who had asthma, pleaded for his inhaler, but the counselors did not give it to him. They believed he was not experiencing an asthma attack, as confirmed by an emergency medical technician on site who saw no signs such as wheezing. For over an hour, Travis struggled against the restraint, his breathing becoming increasingly labored. Despite the counselor's claims that they monitored his vital signs, Travis eventually stopped breathing. The situation turned serious and the counselors finally released him, but it was too late. Travis was transported to a nearby hospital where he passed away the following day, April 21, 2005. The medical examiner ruled Travis's death a homicide, caused by positional asphyxia due to the prolonged face-down restraint. This ruling set off a chain of legal actions. A White County grand jury handed down charges of felony murder, child cruelty, and involuntary manslaughter against the six counselors. White County District Attorney Stan Gunter stated that the charges were based on the criminal negligence or reckless conduct of the individuals involved. Gwen Skinner, an official at the Georgia Department of Human Resources, which oversaw the camp, said that the counselors were not following agency rules or procedures. We do not train staff to do face-down restraints, she emphasized. Despite these allegations, the counselors' defense argued that they were following their training. The case against the six counselors became a point of debate. Defense attorney Abby Guest, representing Matthew Dissing, insisted that the counselors were doing what they were trained to do. This is clearly not a case of counselors gone awry, she said. The counselors maintained that they acted in the best interest of the children they worked with and followed the guidelines provided to them. However, the prosecution argued otherwise. DA Stan Gunter emphasized the reckless nature of the restraint and its deadly consequences. The case was set to go to trial, but in a surprising turn of events, White County Superior Court Judge Lynn Akeley Alderman dismissed the charges of felony murder, involuntary manslaughter, and child cruelty against the counselors. Judge Akeley Alderman's ruling was based on several factors. The medical examiner, Dr. Chris Sperry, testified that Travis's death was due to positional asphyxia, resulting from his prolonged resistance during the restraint. Dr. Sperry suggested that had Travis not struggled so intensely, he might not have died. The judge noted that similar restraints had been applied to Travis in the past without fatal results, and that the counselors could not have foreseen the tragic outcome. The judge's decision to dismiss the charges sparked outrage and disappointment among Travis's family and supporters. Travis's grandmother, Golden Griffin, expressed her frustration and sorrow, stating that those responsible for her grandson's death should be held accountable. The family's attorney, Thomas Cuffey, supported this sentiment emphasizing the need for justice. 
In response to the incident, the Georgia Department of Human Resources retrained its staff on the proper use of restraints and reviewed its policies to ensure clarity and prevent such tragedies in the future. Gwen Skinner stated the importance of making sure that the guidelines were crystal clear to avoid any confusion about when and how restraints should be used. On June 28, 2019, a tragedy occurred at Summer Kids Camp in Altadena, California. Doug Forbes and Elena Matias dropped off their six-year-old daughter, Roxy Forbes, at the camp. It was Roxy's first camp experience. They had been assured that Roxy, who was a beginner swimmer, would stay in the shallow end of the pool and wouldn't need a life jacket. Despite these assurances, Roxy somehow ended up in the deeper part of the pool, about 20 feet away from the shallow steps. The water there was much deeper than she could handle. Roxy was found floating face down in the pool by a counselor from another group. The camp staff, including four lifeguards, had not noticed her struggling. Emergency responders arrived, but Roxy was in full cardiac arrest. She was taken to the hospital where doctors declared her brain dead. She was taken off life support the next day. This tragic event was witnessed by 30 to 40 other children at the camp. Roxy's parents were devastated. Doug Forbes said he would never forget the scream his wife let out when she saw Roxy being taken away by ambulance. The sight of their daughter, who had been a lively and bright child, now blue and unresponsive, was something they could never erase from their minds. Roxy's death was a result of inadequate supervision and failure to follow safety promises. In the wake of their daughter's death, Doug Forbes and Elena Matias have been fighting to ensure no other family experiences a similar tragedy. They discovered that day camps in California, unlike in 40 other states, have little to no regulation. There is no licensing board, no oversight, and the state doesn't even track the number of camps or the children who attend them. The California Department of Social Services investigated Summer Kids Camp and found that it had been operating without a necessary license. The camp has never had the appropriate license, which is required for most child care facilities in California. Summer Kids Camp started the license application process after the incident, but as of the report's publication, the agency had not yet received a complete application. Despite decades of operation, the camp had not followed the licensing requirements. Additionally, the camp is not accredited by the American Camp Association, which sets standards for camp safety. Roxy's parents have filed a lawsuit against Summer Kids Camp, alleging negligent hiring, retention, supervision, and training practices. They are also suing the American Red Cross for fraudulently certifying counselors as lifeguards. The lawsuit aims to hold the camp accountable and to highlight the need for stricter regulations and oversight. In response to this tragedy, State Senator Anthony Portantino introduced a bill that would require day camps in California to be licensed and monitored by local health departments. This bill includes guidelines for CPR training for lifeguards, criminal background checks for all counselors, and proper staffing requirements. Portantino acknowledged that there might be pushback due to the financial implications of these regulations, but he emphasized the importance of preventing future tragedies. Doug Forbes and Elena Matias have also started the Meow Meow Foundation in Roxy's honor. The foundation focuses on water and camp safety. They have launched Roxy's Wish Drowning Prevention Week for Children and are working to bring drowning prevention education into local schools. Their foundation also provides free swim lessons for kids, aiming to make water activities safer for all children. Roxy's parents continue to grieve their loss, but they have chosen to fight for better safety measures to protect other children. They hope that their efforts will prevent other families from experiencing the same heartache they endure every day. On July 15, 2022, an incident occurred on Anderson Island, Washington, involving a 13-year-old boy named Daryl D.J. McCutcheon, Jr. D.J. was attending a summer camp organized by the town of Stylacum. The campers were taken to Florence Lake, where D.J., who had never swum in open water before and was not wearing a life jacket, drowned while trying to swim towards a platform about 30 to 40 feet from the shore. On that day, a camp employee left D.J. and other teenagers unsupervised at the lake while he went to pick up another group of children and a co-worker from a nearby ferry station. During the employee's absence, DJ went underwater and did not resurface for about six minutes. Bystanders eventually noticed DJ's distress and attempted to rescue him. Ernest Roberts, a passerby, spotted DJ about 10 feet underwater, 
pulled him to the surface and started CPR. DJ was then airlifted to Mary Bridge Children's Hospital, where he was pronounced dead later that day. Following this tragedy, DJ's parents, Tamisha and Daryl McCutcheon Sr., filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the town of Stylacombe. They claimed the town was negligent in supervising their son. The McCutcheon's attorneys argued that the camp failed to provide proper water safety training and did not ensure the children were supervised at all times, as required by the town's staff training manual. The manual stated that campers should always be under staff supervision during program hours. The lawsuit revealed that DJ's mother, Tamisha, had signed a waiver accepting risks, including injury or death, from participating in activities near water. However, the McCutcheon's legal team argued that the waiver was a generic release form and did not specify situations where children would be taken to open water. In response to the lawsuit, the town of Stylacombe agreed to pay a $15 million settlement to DJ's family in April 2023. This amount represents more than half of the town's annual budget of $24.5 million. The settlement funds are expected to come from the town's insurance. Paul Loveless, Stylacombe's town administrator, and Amanda Queen, the town's attorney, declined to comment on the case due to ongoing litigation. The final dismissal paperwork had not yet been filed. The McCutcheons, who had moved to the South Sound area in 2019 after being stationed at Joint Base lewis McCord, described DJ as their miracle baby due to years of struggling with infertility. After DJ's death, the family relocated to the Midwest to be closer to relatives. Despite their immense loss, the McCutcheons planned to use the settlement money to start a nonprofit dedicated to promoting aquatic safety at summer camps and to create scholarships in DJ's name. Brett Rosen, one of the McCutcheon's attorneys, emphasized that the lawsuit was about seeking justice for DJ and preventing similar incidents in the future. The McCutcheon's hope that by advocating for better safety measures, other families will not have to endure the same tragedy.